Yes, it's fun. I had a whole acting career in my in my life, and the thing I get recognized most for is being in the audience of Naked Gun Thirty. Boy, are you serious? <laughs> oh yeah, it's hilarious. Hello, Blenders, and welcome, welcome to episode number three hundred and seventeen of Real Blend, a podcast that's still trying to ice skate uphill. <laughs> I, uh, right. I cleaned that up a little bit for you guys on this week's show. Deadpool and Wolverine is crushing the summer box office. It's the movie that the analysts and the theater community was waiting for, bringing all the audiences back to celebrate the new Marvel Studios movie. And director Paul Feig is going to join us to talk about his new film, Jackpot, that's coming to Amazon. Uh, I'm Sean O'Connell, the managing editor at Cinema Blend and co-host of the Real Blend podcast alongside Kevin McCarthy of Fox 5 in Washington, D.C., and Gabe Kovach sitting in the producer's chair. Hello, boys. Hello. Hello. Good to, <laughs> hello. It's good to hello. see you both. Good to see Hi. you, Kev. Kev's Hi. been gone. Good. I know. It's good to see you guys. And uh, I'm just, you know, Marvel Jesus, as Ryan Reynolds' Marvel Deadpool Jesus character here. says it. Yeah. Praise me. The, the, the irony of, okay, so I'm going to even give Ryan credit for thinking ahead, because Kev was just mentioning before we hit record on this, that Deadpool passed, Deadpool 3 passed The Passion of the Christ to yeah. become the highest grossing R-rated movie. Yes. And it makes me wonder if Ryan Reynolds put in the Marvel Jesus line, knowing that this movie might eventually pass The Passion well, of the Christ. I think that's got to be a coincidence, because the Marvel Jesus works so well on its own. Yeah, it does. But, also, yeah. but it does. as I was telling you guys before we recorded, there's a scene in Deadpool 2 Sure. Where he's in the back of a, of a taxi as Deadpool and he, and he and he mentions the domestic box office success of Deadpool <laughs> one. Yeah. And yeah. he says that they're still below the passion of the Christ. <laughs> and I think the passion of the Christ held that record. So I, 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 there is a little bit of minutiae that needs to go into this conversation because I've seen it's a lot like, of different re reporting on this. It is the highest grossing R rated film of all time domestically okay. Um, okay so on a worldwide basis that number one is still joker with a billion oppenheimer is 977 million and then deadpool and wolverine is the third highest grossing worldwide film of all but time we think but, it's gonna oh it's gonna it's gonna pass yeah. oppenheimer it's gonna pass joker but at the moment it is as we're recording today tuesday august 6th it is the highest grossing r-rated film domestically that record was held by Passion of the Christ for, I think, over 20 years. It's 20 years. I, sure. It's yeah. been a long time. And so 370 million was the domestic total of Passion of the Christ, I believe. And remember, that's the total run. Deadpool and Wolverine right. has only been out for less than two weeks. Or, what, or yeah. was it, is it like right. how many weeks have we been out? July 26th to August I mean, 6th. It hasn't even we, been 14 days, right? Right. No, yeah, yeah. It's a week no. and a half. Yeah. yeah. So the, that, I mean, those numbers are insane. To your question about whether or not the Marvel Jesus line has to be. I, I, it's so funny because I didn't think about it like that. I didn't either. Because there's a joke in Deadpool 2 about Passion of the Christ. Right, right, right. I can't. I, there's no way Ryan. But Gabe's right. Like calling himself Marvel Jesus as a way to like save the sure. MCU also fits the tone. Just perfect. Yeah. But 100%. Ryan's always playing 3D chess. It just makes me right. feel like <laughs> he kind of put that in knowing that they were going to pass. It, I feel like it has to be. And like and and so now what's crazy about it is like the box office success of this. It's well, I think one of the things that I I wish there was more conversation about is the the path that Blade laid for um for R-rated superhero films in sure. in general. I mean, Blade yeah. 1 was what year? Two uh, was it 99 90, or 2000? No, it was before 2000. 98? 90, Might have been 98. It was yeah, around there 97, 98. So I think it's important to stop and step aside and think, yeah. of, think about what what Blade did. Sure. Um, yeah. Blade one. It was before Blade. What what was the biggest superhero film of all time? Before, oh, besides well, Batman, Batman Tim and Burton. Superman. Were yeah, the I was going to say ones. Batman and Superman. Yeah. yeah. But outside of that, Don, we had Donner's no, Batman, a uh, Donner Superman and, and Burton's Batman franchise, okay. which became Schumacher's franchise. So right. sure. But the, the current Marvel wasn't doing anything. Mar Marvel finally got off the ground with Blade. Right. And then and then obviously and then the superhero era, I, would, I would say kicked in with X-Men. Yeah. Yeah. And so and Blade kind of really is something that we need to talk more about. I know Ryan posted this the other day on his Instagram. It is really crazy to think that one Blade was a Marvel film and it was R rated. 
Yeah. And and it and it was so successful. Blade 2 was great with Guillermo del Toro. The third one ironically has Ryan Reynolds in it, Blade Trinity. And so I just think it's interesting and then obviously with Deadpool 1's success in 2016, that was, you know, that was another success story in what Blade kind of paved in well, the idea of what R-rated films can do. I mean, this story, an R-rated Marvel film in the MCU and the box office success that it's had, it's not surprising in a way, but it is kind of crazy if you, you actually know, think little, about. What's a little crazy too, though, what the precedent of it is Joker also. Like Joker going R yeah. and making over a billion for DC. Yes. Huge. And then this going R and making over a billion should give both Marvel and DC a little more um, comfort. <laughs> Yeah, you know, co- confidence, I guess, to potentially and, go that route. So I think, I, I, think, really, I think Marvel's really smart about picking and choosing its battles, though. Sure. Like, I think I think and, you know, to give Kevin Feige credit to Marvel kind of built its name on letting each movie be its quote unquote own thing, still being like mm-hmm. a Marvel MCU feel, but taking right. a coming of age story and making this taking, uh, you know, a heist movie and making this. I think that they also. I'm hoping what they get from this is that they now have the the latitude to go R and they and they, you know, something like this Mahershala Ali blade or well, whatever <laughs> might be coming. will get that sort of leg room. And with Blade, with the first Blade, I do want to kind of point out, I don't think that they were making a Marvel movie. Like, I don't think right. they thought they were making a Marvel movie. I don't think they thought they were making a horror it. movie. Yeah. Yeah. They wanted yeah. to make a horror movie. Yeah. I, I want to go back and rewatch the first Blade because. I wonder what the Marvel logo looked like at the time. I mean, I have to go back and look at it, but I'm sure it's just red. I think it's a static red Marvel, okay. Marvel comics kind of thing. I mean, the opening, and so we're gonna get to box office later in the show. But a couple more, two more quick points about what we're talking about. The opening of Blade One is one of my favorite openings in movie history. When they go to the club and like the blood's coming down from like the 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 uh, what do you call it? The Those sprinkler, things systems? That, the sprinkler, sprinkler systems. Sprinkler systems. Yeah. But the line, the the. The, ups, the uh, skating uphill line is a line that I've been quoting since I saw the first Blade. My, <laughs> my friends and I quoted that line ex- like to, to an exhaustion. Well, Wesley and then, Snipes is cool. Yeah, He's just but cool. <laughs> are, can I mention spoilers at this point, Gabe, for Deadpool? Movie uh, I so? mean, I'll just say let people know. Like, yeah, yeah, it's it's we're a couple weeks in. It's made almost a okay. million dollars. So we'll dip into spoilers. I think the kind of spoilers we're going to dip into you. Like you'll just have seen on TikTok. Yeah. Like, like, like I, people have just been recording the movie screen. And yeah. Posting I, these I've clips, seen so. chunks of the movie I, just yeah, blasting like, across uh, social media. And so so when Blade says that line in Deadpool Wolverine, it was just like that was the moment. Everybody's talking about like Wolverine's mask coming down or whatever. That was the thing that hit me because yeah, yeah. I was so obsessed. That's the cool yeah. thing the movie does is it. Literally, you know, it's paying homage to the Fox universe, but it gives those kind of thi- for for those of us that kind of grew up around those movies. It really does yeah. treat those with respect, which is cool. The last thing I want to say is this. Um, we're talking about Joker and Deadpool Wolverine. So D- Joker is cons- is right now the highest grossing R-rated film in worldwide film history. Oppenheimer 2, Deadpool Wolverine 3. The difference between Joker and Deadpool Wolverine in terms of their R rating is fascinating to me because sure. Joker feels disturbing and brutal mm. yeah. and then deadpool wolverine still somehow feels cartoonish in in well, a good an R- way yeah it's an r-rated comedy versus like an r-rated but uh, you know thriller-ish adult but, but do you know what drama. i mean though like the violence is like okay a lot of the violence in deadpool wolverine is done through regenerative what's the word regenerative effects like the characters can regenerate so yeah, like yeah. A yeah, lot of the sure. like the fight between Deadpool and Wolverine in the car or the the fight where the one loses old... some of the stakes. It loses. It does reduce some of the stakes. I like it, though. I, I, mm-hmm. I like that the violence can be more comic booky and more fun because like everyone's seen the film. There's this one or old boy tracking shot where they're fighting all the Deadpools. Mm. And it's just it, it's just blood spurting everywhere, but it doesn't feel brutal. Sure. It just feels yeah. like fun. Yeah. And I think it's interesting how Joker and this can both be R-rated superhero films, but have completely different tones yeah. in terms of their violence. That's yeah. fascinating to me. Cater to the audience. So, well, hello. Thank you for joining Roblin this week. If you're watching us on YouTube, uh, hit subscribe, turn on your notifications. This is the kind of conversation you're going to get every single week when we get together to talk about films. We're going to get into the box office results of Deadpool and Wolverine. And also Kev's going to give his full on review for it. But if you're, uh, 
here or you'd like to if you're listening on audio and you'd like to see what we are uh talking what we look like when we're talking for the, the <laughs> i am completely lost in this. It's YouTube, <laughs> youtube.com backslash real blend podcast if you want to see our faces thank you Gabe. i appreciate <laughs> yes. it also i owe everybody a newsletter this week and you can get the newsletter by signing up for real blend premium check the description for information on where to sign up okay so hopefully oh no no before we talk about deadpool we gotta get to this week's guest uh, paul guess? feig paul feig is a great great dude um, a gem wait wait paul feig star of heavyweights star of heavyweights, star of heavyweights. correct one of the yes. one of my fa- favorite movies as a kid I, I haven't seen it in years but isn't ben's ben is it ben stiller's character in heavyweights basically his dodgeball character yes i believe so <laughs> yeah <laughs> this is so good and you're gonna anyway. love this too kev um because jake did ask him um when he decides to put himself into his movies when when yeah. he has to cast himself in a paul feig film and he tells a great story about why he plays the character that he plays in jackpot this week so jackpot yeah. is um a sci-fi comedy set in the not too distant future where people enter a lottery um and they find out that they win the lottery but then everybody in los angeles has 24 hours to kill that person and claim their prize <laughs> And Aquafina ends up winning the lottery, and then she has to avoid getting killed by groups of people for 24 hours in order to claim her prize. And Paul Feig describes it as his chance to make a Jackie Chan movie, and that's the best way to describe it. Like it's it's over the top funny, comedic, action packed. John Cena is in it as someone who's protecting um, Aquafina from the time that she gets her her winnings, essentially. Uh, and it's just it's a perfect setup for Paul Feig and the type of comedy that he delivers. So uh, Jake and I got a chance to sit down with him a little bit earlier and talk about Jackpot and his career and the industry in general and the absence of comedies uh, at the theater. I think you guys are going to find this to be a really interesting conversation. So uh, Paul Feig joining the Rebel End podcast to talk about his new film, Jackpot. <laughs> Paul, it is always an honor to speak with you, sir. How are you, handsome? I am great. Thank you. So how are you guys doing today? We're doing so well. We're very excited to be chatting with you. Um, I'm going to kick us off from here. And I, I want to start out by just complimenting you as, as a director and a filmmaker. Uh, you know, because I, I feel like between someone like John Cena and then someone like Jason Statham and someone like John Hamm, you have a great knack for pulling really hilarious performances out of guys who uh, oftentimes are known for being serious. I'm just sort of curious as a director, is there a difference between how you direct someone who is known for comedy versus someone who is not known for comedy no i mean if anything you just tell them don't be funny <laughs> you know because th- that's the worst thing that happened i remember when uh, when we were did the first read through I, I just did it with jason for for spy i had each person come in individually and we just read through it to hear how it was playing and he was like so, so should i try to play this funny and i said jason you have to play this like it's the most serious movie you've ever made in your life <laughs> And that's why it works. You know, there's nothing worse than people trying to be funny. And that's funny. People know you don't try to be funny. You just find the funny. Well, oh, we do had... they get discouraged? Uh, do they get discouraged when you tell them that? No, they're actually kind of relieved, to, to be quite honest, you know. But, you know, but then a character like you know, the John uh, Cena is playing in in Jackpot, that's like, it, it's a kind of a nerdier character. And so he really loved it. I had all these alternate jokes for him and, and stuff. And then he started doing his own thing. And, uh, you know, they get very comfortable. But the, the smartest people I know who are actors have a natural governor that just kind of says, I can go here, but if I go here, it's too much. We had Barry Sonnenfeld on the show a couple of years back, and he said one of the best notes he ever had to give was telling Tommy Lee Jones on Men in Black, don't be funny, because if you try to be funny, especially next to Will Smith, it's not going to work out well for you. 100%. No, they just say it gets what we call in the business sweaty. And there's nothing worse than a sweaty performance. You see somebody's working so hard to be funny, and you're like, oh, dude, just take it. I've no. never heard that expression before. That's so interesting. <laughs> oh, we say it all the time. We're always like, oh, that's really sweaty. Okay, let's just not do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to use that on our podcast now to tell Jake <laughs> when to dial it back a few times nice. um paul i think the best satire obviously brushes a little bit too close to reality uh, and obviously this is the premise of jackpot's pretty far-fetched but as you were going through it because you do go out of your way to sort of root it in uh, a form of reality i think where you're not going as broad as you possibly could have how many years away are we from the grand lottery <laughs> or something like this the movie, we're only six years away so <laughs> no i mean I, it's it's I, I you know honestly when i first were when i first was given the script and just told the premise i was like that sounds insane i don't even know if i want to read the script but then when i read it it was just the characters were so funny and the way it was written and the the situation was so 
funny to me. And the fact that Rob Yescom, who wrote it, wrote in that there's no guns allowed in the in the lottery, which that changed the game for me. Like if it was if it was a gunplay movie, I'd be out. I, I don't have any interest in though. I can I can enjoy those movies. You know, I love the John Wick movies and all that, but I just don't want to do that kind of thing. But then it just became like a big Jackie Chan movie to me. I was just like the fun of people pursuing somebody even though they want to kill them it just it makes it it, it makes it a little less mean-spirited i think but the, the way that we are able to do it the way it was written and uh that just really it drew me to it but i also look i have a lot of faith in mankind and it, so many people see this movie and they're like this feels like it could happen i'm like yeah but i don't know i, I think we'd get right to the edge of that happening yeah. just like with the purge but i don't think it would happen i think people would sober up <laughs> And the other thing I like about this movie is the fact that it's not like The Purge where you have no choice, you're in The Purge. This is like, yeah. you buy a ticket. If you want to be part of this, you buy a ticket. And if you yeah. don't, all these other people are just like, okay, they're nuts. So uh, so maybe it could happen. Who knows? <laughs> I feel like society's pretty lazy. Maybe we wouldn't go through all this. <laughs> that's, <my feeling. laughs> that's, that's the reason we wouldn't do it. We're like, ah. <laughs> give, give me yeah. comfort or give me death. Exactly. <laughs> you, um, know, you know, <laughs> Paul, in addition to uh, being a brilliant writer and, and a great director, uh, you're also a really hilarious actor. And I'd love to know how you decide whether or not to ever give yourself a role in your own movies. And, and why don't you do it more often? Uh, the, the loss of power when you step in front of a camera as a director is so titanic that it really makes you go, oh, because I spend my whole day saying, oh, try this, try that, oh, adjust this. So I'm just basically kind of critiquing people all day. So when I suddenly get in front of the camera and I do my thing, all I can hear is everybody going like, this is the guy that's telling me how to do stuff. <laughs> He's terrible. <laughs> so I only kind of do things if, like in Jackpot, I have a little mini cameo at the end where I come out because we wrote that joke at the last minute and I was like oh I need a lawyer <laughs> it's like well I wear a suit every day so okay I'll be the lawyer <laughs> but I needed a haircut so I have that the, the worst groomed uh, lawyer in the world when you see that I'd still hire you sir thank you so much <laughs> uh, Paul when uh, Fly Me to the Moon came out recently somebody had commented um, that it was one of the only adult serious comedies that was coming to the uh, theaters this summer that it's just a dearth of, of comedy. Um, I'm really glad you're getting a chance to make this with Amazon and people get a chance to see it, but, but how challenging is it to get an original idea like this, or even just a comedy into theaters nowadays? It's hard. You know, I mean, uh, uh, comedies haven't been performing over the past number of years, the way they should at the theater. I don't know if that's the movie's fault. I don't know if it, you know, look, I'm a theater, a movie theater guy. It's my favorite thing in the world. All our movies, including jackpot are tested in front of an audience of 250 people off the street. You know, we, we, we engineer the whole thing so that an audience can kind of have this group experience, but at the same time, we want to get the movies made and I want to get them seen. And there's nothing worse than having a movie that people don't see. So um, I'm just very grateful to Amazon for, for even for taking a chance on a big comedy because, you know, like big action comedies just don't get made that much. I mean, either you got Deadpool, which is gigantic, or you've you know kind of got your indie indie films and uh, it was I was just so happy to get to make this movie and and just you know really grateful of them. But you have the movies that prove that this like spot the spy and and the heat like those are those are proven commodities. Like I don't understand why we don't have more of those in theaters. Yeah, I know. I just think comedy goes through these waves and um, you know you look around they they just there aren't big studio produced comedies now because audiences are are changing too. And they're getting the audience has always been suspicious of comedy, especially in the last uh, 15 years, I would say. I just know from my experience, you know, sure. we're putting out a trailer, the hostility that comes out at, at the same time that the, the, you know, the love comes out is really interesting. Like when we put out the, you know, the trailer for Bridesmaids. And the heat and spy, all that, there's so much feedback of like, oh, well, clearly all the best jokes are in the trailer. And but like, it's like, why? We're not trying to pull one over on you, I swear. We are yeah. trying to laugh. But I think I think audiences have just kind of been burned by a lot of comedies, or they were. And then I think all the studios kind of went, well, let's just kind of step away. And honestly, these days, horror is the new comedy. I mean, yeah. Megan is a comedy. I'm sorry. It's it, it's one of my it's my probably my favorite movie of last year, but that's a comedy, you know. And, sure. and so that's what we're doing. It's when I was trying to get uh, the first simple favor made and one studio dropped it at the last minute and I was trying to get it made other places. 
And a lot of feedback I got from studio heads was like, we can't do it because it's mixed genre. And, you know, in these days, everything's mixed genre. And I think it's great because I actually I think it's a great way to do comedy when you it's like, you know, putting putting the pill in the peanut butter for the dog, you know, <laughs> like you come in expecting something else and then you get the comedy, but you still get that the high emotions of action or drama or 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 horror, you know, so it's 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 evolving. I've got to say, I'd, I'd imagine uh, that, that Aquafina is is great at improv. I, I've done interviews with her, and I'm always amazed at just just the shit that she comes up with at any given moment. <laughs> She's one of the funniest people I've ever met. And you've worked with so many brilliant actors who are genius at improv. What is your favorite moment from one of your past movies that was never once on the page and actually came about during the day? Well, I mean, God, there's so many, but honestly, in the heat. Um, that whole dinner table sequence when uh, when Sandra Bullock is dragged over to uh, Melissa McCarthy's family's house, that was it was scripted. But like there was like Nate Cordry, uh, you know, and uh, and and, um, uh, and and some of the other characters didn't have any lines. And I was just like they, and they're all improv performers. I was like, just just come and sit at the table and something's going to happen. And we got, you know, so Nate, that whole thing about like, you a knock, are you a knock? You know, that whole thing that just came out of like, okay, Nate, it's your turn. What are you going to do? And then Sandra was hilariously going like, I, I don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> and then Jamie Denbo had the whole thing. Are you a boy or a girl? You know, all that stuff, you know, it just, it all came out of just us being there and they're all so funny. So, you know, and then we go back to the editing room with this wealth of all this stuff and just kind of wrangle it in the shape. But, but that said, we don't do tons of improv on the set. Now, you know, a lot of a lot of the Ghostbusters haters always go, there's all this improv. There's not improv. It's just we have, oh, we have this joke. Let's try this joke. Let's try this joke. Surprise me with your joke. But you never go off script, really, because the script is a very is a blueprint we work on for years, quite frankly. And if we if you just go like just do whatever you want, it's just chaos. But if you can get some great moments out of just people in the moment surprising each other that that makes an audience feel like they're there for something special because it doesn't feel over rehearsed and overwritten oh that's awesome that's interesting yeah no well, you haven't honestly well if i can tie on to that like for jackpot we we had so many alt jokes and so much stuff which is why i put it like a whole you know outtakes thing in the end credits and that's not it that's just the tip of the iceberg but when we were testing it we also found that audiences wanted only so many jokes these days, you know? Mm -hmm. So they would kind of, it's too, it's too silly. They, like they want the danger first then they want to stay with the characters and be in the moment. And if there's too many jokes, it starts to feel like, you know, I'm, I, we're not taking it seriously or something. It's, and that's kind of how comedy has been changing over the last few years. I mean, you know, if you look at the, the number of jokes we have in Bridesmaids, The Heat, Spy, we still have a, a good amount in jackpot, but I just, we had to weed them down. Um, and I get it because, you know, you want to, audiences want a level of, of realism out of absurd situations. So that's my favorite kind of comedy. Real characters, even though they're extreme characters in extreme situations, and how do they deal with it the way that the audience would if they were in that same situation. Not being funny, kind of you said, like not, not being sweaty. Yeah, exa exactly, yeah. that's exactly it. I get that, but as a director making a comedy, I can't imagine getting notes back from a test audience that was like, less jokes. <laughs> would, no, it is. It's just, so no, it's just you watch it, and yeah, they go, you know, there's a, these boxes they can check of what, what the description, and if you get corny cheesy, you're like, oh, fuck, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> they hit that corny cheesy box. It's bad. And also, honestly, I just do it really, I, I'm, I'm not even that reliant on their written feedback. I'm just reliant mm -hmm. on when we're watching the movie, what gets yeah. laughed and what doesn't. We record the mm -hmm. audience and we watch them and you go like, oh shit, okay, there's two jokes too many in that scene because that one killed, so let's get rid of the others. Because we always say in the editing room, uh, no, no singles or doubles, only triples and home runs. And that's all we can have <laughs> in the movie. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you brought up triples and home runs because the person who I think is going to get him in jackpot is um, MGK. And he a little bit speaks to you have this incredible eye for finding people who we just don't expect to be incredibly funny. <laughs> um, uh, Chris Hemsworth in Ghostbusters is one that jumps out as well, too. Yeah. When you find someone like that, how do you know, you know, the right amount to use them, not to overuse them? Uh, and do you have I would assume with MGK, I would assume with Hemsworth, you just have 
reams and reams of outtakes with them that that you could fill a movie with essentially yeah you know i mean you really i I always like to meet the person first i like with chris with ghostbusters you know we have the same agent and my agent said well chris it sounds he actually said he'd be interested in being in the movie it's like oh cool so so I, i had lunch with them and just talking to him in his normal australian accent and just getting to know him i go like god you are funny man so i said like i want you in this don't put on an accent i want your natural accent and we're just gonna kind of you know use your own natural funniness and he starts improv and like you know that whole uh, the scene where they're interviewing him he comes up with the whole mike hat thing and all the like and <laughs> it's really annoying that he looks like he does and he's funny and he's super nice like it's kind of frustrating to be honest it, it's really not fair it's really you almost <laughs> you want to hate him but he's so lovable that you can't uh, be yeah. it's just too talented across the board but uh, no, it's really, it, it's kind of just fun to let them, to, to surprise people with what they can do and, and let them play. And they, you know, they people really like to be seen for more of who they are, <laughs> you know, it, it, especially if you are, if the public knows you one way. That's why it's really fun to undercut things. And, and sometimes sure. people are nervous about it, but then they, they the response they get is so great. And it, MGK is just, He's just such a a trooper, you know, I mean, when I talked to him on Zoom before he came to set, I was just kind of just sussing out, like, is he going to have a sense of humor about himself? And he and he does. He was like, he's serious uh, when you talk to him in real life. But he's also like, yeah, I just want to make sure that I don't that that people know that I'm having fun or making fun of myself. Yeah, definitely. And what you know. we put him through. We, we, we taste him in the face. We drag him downstairs and throw him in a pool. You know, we uh, we put him through it, and he was just so happy to to do all of it. He's I I love the guy. I mean, I really have a soft spot for him. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, Paul, whenever I was a kid, I grew up and rewatched it over and over again. I had a tape of um, Naked Gun 33 and one third. <laughs> and uh, I, I as a movie, as a kid who was also a movie fan, I loved that the giant crescendo, the final act is the Academy Awards. Yeah. And uh, I think eagle eye viewers uh, or maybe fans of yours maybe don't m- might not know that you're in that audience. You're in the Oscars audience in Naked Gun. Yes, it's fun. I had a whole acting career in my in my life, and the thing I get recognized most for is being in the audience of Naked Gun Thirty. Boy, are you serious? <laughs> oh yeah, it's hilarious because and I'll tell you that story on that. Pete Siegel, who's a good friend of mine, who directed that. They had the movie all put together and they realized when in the editing room they were missing all these reaction shots. And so they said, would you come in? I got to do some some extra, you know, reshoots and just be the guy in the audience. So it's myself and my friend Joel Madison, who's sitting next to me, who's a writer extraordinaire, comedy writer extraordinaire. And um, and it's just like, OK, look embarrassed. Look at this. And so it's it's in the movie and it just makes me laugh to this day. That Oh, well, I was going to ask you about like if you got to share uh, breathing air with uh, with Leslie but you wouldn't have been on set that day. Nobody. It was just literally Joel and I and some extras around us in the shot is just like that. That's it. So <laughs> did you ever get to meet Leslie at any point? No, no, which I oh. love to. I mean, what a hero he was. Uh, I mean, that's, mad. that's an, ex- I mean, uh, the, the, the way he, uh, not that he's not trying to be funny, but the way he, he plays Frank and all those characters so straight in a way is uh, I, it's still just, it, it, it makes me laugh so hard. No, I mean, it's masterful. And that's what, it's so funny guys like that you know it's just like what my my pal will arnett you know it was a dramatic actor and him uh, when i was directing arrested development the, the hardest thing in the world was for me to not ruin takes because will just because he commits so hard to everything and that's hilarious if you're playing a goofy it wouldn't be funny at all but the fact that he's so serious is just spectacular i think and- one of the pop culture lines i use the most is i've made a huge mistake <laughs> exactly exactly it's just fast you know like a talent like arnett is just be, it's so wicked fast you know it's oh, insane no. how the how quick the brain moves oh no I, I still laugh once once a week when i think back to his chicken dance caw, caw, caw. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, Where did that I, I also love all of their chicken dances i know well yeah honestly uh, so the other cha chicha chicha was, yeah. <laughs> the came up with that. i was just like that's the dumbest thing i've ever heard <laughs> <laughs> did that feel like a big swing on set that totally. day? Paul? I mean, the dance thing. <laughs> no, but I, 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 nothing makes me happier than people who would just go for it. You know, yeah. it's, it's, I'd rather pull somebody back than have to push them to do more. Mm. 
Yeah. Well, and to that effect, w- what camp does Cena fall into? Because it feels like he That's doesn't mind he, going for it. He is game big. for anything. <laughs> I mean, he just wants to be funny. He loves doing comedy. It's his favorite thing. But he's also smart enough to know not to push it too far. So he's he's very smart and deliberate about it. Um, it. I think it just comes from the years of being in the WWE. They have to be so precise, you know, sure. with their stunt work and all that. I mean, you know, one false move and somebody gets hurt or, or whatever. So I think he brings all that to both his physical action and to his delivery of dialogue. But he's really brilliant. I mean, you know, there's so many alts and like in the end credits, you see that whole thing where he's telling things about himself. And we wrote a million different jokes for that. And I would just stand on the set and kind of read these to him. And I'm terrible on set. I can barely read through it. So I'm just like, then I kind of stumbled my way through it. And he just popped it back off. Perfect, word perfect, and hilarious. I'm like, okay, we got that. Let's do the next one. So he just, every day he surprised me with how good he was. Paul, when we spoke and uh, you and I got a chance to sit down at, at uh, Comic Con and discuss this film before going to you told this great I got story to hang about out with Paul at Comic Con. Yeah, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Letting, uh, where were you? Man? You know. Yeah, we're special. <laughs> Chicago, <laughs> lazy man. Um, and you read the title of this script and it, it just didn't move you. You put it aside, and it's only that someone came around and told you, like, no, 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 go back and read that script. It's really funny. You know that that we're sitting here talking to you for jackpot. Yeah. Um, can you th- can you think of another example of a script that just you didn't give at the time you passed on it and went on to become something huge? Oh, <laughs> there's a couple, but I don't want to say them because it's too embarrassing to say what I think. Um, it's just us talking. Yeah, yeah, is that it? Nobody will hear this? No, no there's politics <laughs> around one of them. But but uh, um, no, I mean, I. That, but that happens, though, I guess. Oh, it definitely happens. It definitely happens. I mean, I've actually, uh, other than this one thing, I, I've avoided it because I'm pretty open and I'm pretty good at kind of seeing what I think an audience is going to respond to. But that's the hardest part of my job, too, is figuring out what do people what do I think people want to see? And nobody can predict that. There's no way. Sure. But there's yeah. just something you feel in the air, you know, and if you read something, you go like, oh, I, this feels like it's kind of in the air right now. I don't know how else to kind of describe it than that. And you have to run it through a filter. I always when I lecture to film students and stuff, say like, you'll come up with a bunch of ideas you think are great, but then you have to run it through what I call the audience filter, which is, okay, if you saw a trailer for that idea and you didn't know you and you didn't make it, would you go, I got to see that movie or be like, "Eh, okay, I'll wait. And it's amazing how many ideas get weeded out when you do that. And I always say this as a commercial filmmaker. I mean, if you're an indie filmmaker, look, I think everybody should want to make movies that are commercial or that everybody wants to see because why else are we doing this? You know, yeah. um, but at the same time, you, you do have to think of audience first, really. It has to appeal to you. If you don't have the energy for it, you clearly can't do it because sure. 24 hour day, you know, seven days a week job. It's all you think about. Um, but then, you know, I always say filmmakers who aren't first and foremost in service of the audience are doing everybody a disfavor. And, and, and like, I have a particular frustration with movies that are Oscar bait, not that that they are great movies, but there's a lot that get made that are made because they want to win awards. And sure. those movies don't end up really winning awards. You know, that's the thing, because they're not pleasing an audience. It's just like, oh, we're being smarter or being this or that. And it's like, you know, look, look at, uh, you know, Oppenheimer. Who would have thought that would be a crowd pleaser? <laughs> but it's, yeah. it's, it's a great movie and it's in its awards thing. Look, we got nominated for two Oscars for Bridesmaids. Do you think any of us went into that movie going like, I think we can win some Oscars, <laughs> get nominated. For <laughs> yeah. no, we this people- is the one. This is the one the Academy <laughs> is going to respond to. In people's heads. That's not generally Oscar bait. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? It has to be funny. It has to be funny two years from now, too. Right, Paul? Because of the amount of time that goes into putting a movie together. Well, that, well and that, that's the biggest thing like you know so many movies go down because they're chasing a trend and it'd be one thing if you could be like south park and like a week later it comes out you know but a movie yeah like you say movies take forever and by the time you you miss you know miss the zeitgeist it's moved on to something else is it by putting modern music in in movies is so dangerous like you know songs because and that's what i i always try to get classic songs or songs that have stood the test of time to put in because 
I've had that happen when you're like, this song's hot. Okay, we'll put it in. Okay, six months from now, everybody's like, oh, God, that song. And it's like, oh, we thought we were cool. And then just look like an old man, like, hey, kids, you heard this song? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> Hello, fellow kids. <laughs> We've heard it groups, exactly. Thanks. I mean, talking about things that stood the test of time, I don't know who won Best Supporting Actress that year, but, I mean, we're still talking about Melissa McCarthy's performance and i got i i would have killed to have seen her oscar speech it would have been great i mean look our our pal octavia spencer won so so okay all right then i can't knock that she's really great i do love her it was, I, didn't, I, really, I didn't realize that that was the that was who won. i knew it was going to be someone that was great no no but I, I wish they could give out a dual one or there could be a tie that that would be my dream <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, you know, Paul, well, Sean and I are both lucky enough sometimes to get to do uh, junkets on the Universal lot. Sometimes they just take it. And it's I don't care. I mean, I've been doing this for a very long. I don't care how many times I, I go on that lot. I just get lost in the magic of being there and, and just sort of being behind the scenes. And um, according to my research, which doesn't always pay off. So forgive me if this is wrong. Used to be a tour guide. Oh, yeah. Universal was, tour guide. Yeah, I was a tour guide in 1981. So that's how old I am. OK, but that's I mean, that was in the like the, the Spielberg like universe days i'm just sort of curious what 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 uh, what that time period on that on that law was like it was great i mean that was you know jaws was already there and stuff mm -hmm. but um but it was the year that they opened up the um it was a special effects um state it was the first time they did one where you had to like get off and go into an attraction mm -hmm. and then come out the other side into a different tour guide and so um so that was really cool but i mean you know that was back when a lot of the stuff wasn't that impressive i mean the big finale was the um it was the, this ice cave from the six million dollar man from the bigfoot episode of six million dollar man where you went in and it was spinning and you were like oh that's crazy which i don't even know that it's still there i'm sure they renamed it by now but um yeah so but, it, it was very fun it was fun but also like that that was also the time i feel like you know there wasn't dvd special features like people didn't know how that stuff worked so people you know it may, maybe it wasn't as impressive as it is today but people also i think were more enamored with with that sort of stuff I mean, when i was I, I think six or seven that we came to to california and took this tour and i my mind was blown and it's because they had the props from the incredible shrinking man <laughs> so there's like giant chairs and stuff and it to me a movie studio is a magical magical place you know universal paramount the fox lot i mean disney lot any of those you go on that you expect to see like in, in the movies like guys dressed like astronauts and yeah. <laughs> going into the commissary you know which doesn't happen anymore sadly but dancing uh, girls and yeah, clowns yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the the camels oh my god only in movies you see that, but um, I, I love it. I love being on those lots, and it was real. It was it was a great moment in my, in my life because it's actually when I was at. I, I'd come from Michigan at 17 to be a tour guide, and that it was there after my freshman year of college in in Michigan at Wayne State. I learned about the USC Film School, and so I applied and got got to go there, and so I've been here ever since. Wow. Well, we'll get you out of here on this, and I'll I'll build off this a little bit too. No um, what's the difference between the first day on set and the last day on set? On the last day, are, are you laser focused on getting into the edit? Is some of the enthusiasm waned? Is it more exciting? T tell me over the years and and even on Jackpot, <laughs> well, what's the first day like versus it, the last? It's day? definitely the last day of school, you know, and, and everybody's giddy and everybody's and you always have to like you know, the the, the scary thing about making movies is at any point of the day you can ruin the movie you know and so the first day of a movie is exciting but it's also terrifying like the night before you're you're in bed going like we're not actually starting a movie you can't believe you're going to be on a set and you're going to be shooting this it just kind of it doesn't register because it seems so in the ether and then you get there and suddenly says you know it's it's like that book bird by bird on a movie it's just shot by shot so okay get this, get that, get it. And then suddenly you're just racking them up, you know? And I find the scariest part of a movie is the middle of production because you have the energy going into it. So you, everything's cracking along and you're doing really well because everybody's excited and all that. And your energy's big and you're all set for it. But you get to the middle and you still have, actually right before the middle, because you still have more than halfway to go and you're starting to get a little tired and and you're just like, oh man, and it's going really well and you're getting good reports from the studio, hopefully about the dailies. And you're like, all I can do is screw this up. And so you start getting more and more worried about the days that you're tired of like, I gotta stay laser focused, I gotta laser focused to get this good. So by the time you get to the end, 
everybody's giddy. And sometimes you're like, all right, everybody, this is great, but we got to, you know, it, but I always try to make sure that, and a lot of filmmakers do this. You try to load the hardest stuff at the beginning of, of the movie, because I've had movies where the big finale you're shooting the last week and you're just like, Oh man, <laughs> you're running on fumes and you just Yikes. this giant thing. And to, to, to be honest, jackpot was that way. We shot the whole auditorium scene. That was towards the end of the schedule. Damn. And it was terrifying just because it was we had a lot, a lot of stuff. And we didn't have enough days to do it really. And um, but we got it. You always get it. That's the thing. You always get it <laughs> somehow. <laughs> Paul, we can't thank you enough for coming on the show, man. It's really good to talk to you. I hope we started your day off with some questions you don't you won't hear a ton today. This is the highlight of my day, my friend. It, Wait, I'm getting you for TV. It can't be the highlight of your day. Uh, oh, sorry, he right. said it. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh, good. Well, see, it's the the second second. Big there we go. Right. <laughs> I gotta see Always you. a pleasure to have you on, Paul. You we want to thank our good friends at Amazon Prime, but also Paul Feig for coming on the show. His new film is going to hit Prime Video on August 15th. So make sure you're looking out for that. OK, the big story um, the past couple of weeks has just been the behemoth. The Deadpool and Wolverine has been at the box office uh, at the time that we are recording it domestically. It has earned three hundred and ninety five million dollars internationally 428 million dollars it's showing no signs of slowing down so in the grand scheme of things what i want to talk about is the fact that a it has no no real competition coming out like we were talking about borderlands it feels like that one's kind of flying under the radar the reviews for it have been largely negative from people who have been able to see it uh, after that is alien Romulus. I think there's some people who are excited for Romulus, but it doesn't feel like it has a big push. Like Deadpool could legitimately ride through August yeah. um, as still packing in theaters. And I want to talk about it in the grand scheme of like Marvel in general, um, because, you know, there have been films that have done really well. Doctor Strange made a lot of money. Um, I don't think it, I think it ended up somewhere in the 800 range. I think Thor did well too, but not anywhere near as close to this. So, you know, this is the one going to be the first Marvel film since No Way Home, which isn't that long ago. Like No Way Home was maybe three or four movies ago to cross a billion dollars. And everyone's like, oh, Marvel's back. But I don't know if Marvel's back. I still feel like Marvel's going to be a case by case basis. And while the the trailers for like Captain America, Brave New World looked interesting, I don't know if it's a automatic tee up you know, Marvel films are going to cross a billion dollars. It feels like they still have to be this type of crossover event. I think there was the idea of seeing Hugh Jackman back on screen um, drove a lot of this box office. The idea of seeing Wolverine and Deadpool paired together for a movie is what drove people to the box office. And it might be, um, you know, one of these big Avengers movies that the Russos are going to do that are going to be the next Marvel billion dollar films. I'm not quite sure that Thunderbolts or... Or Captain America, you know, have the capacity to get to that point. Kev, do you think this is a bit of a one off for Marvel or is that are they restoring their their luster? Well, I guess my question with with Robert Downey Jr. and Dr. Doom. Sure. Um, I know there's been a lot of that, that seems to be a very controversial. Well, decision. let me get your take on it. What What did you think? I haven't even talked to you about that. What did what do you think about that casting? Well, I mean, I'm I'm using this as a way to talk about the box office because I know that Downey was and 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 I know this was discussed on last week's show. I'm just talking about it more from a box office perspective of like, to your point, is that is that something that they could utilize to bring people back to the theaters? And I don't yeah. know that that is as exciting. Um, I I think that the Downey interest definitely is because it's the question of why. Like, I don't think anyone's going to protest Downey coming back. They're just going to be like, how do they make this work? Should I be mad? And they'll, they're they going to buy yeah. their ticket for like, <laughs> should I be mad? And then but we'll find out. I, I think I think I think my point is this. Like, I don't I have no problem with Downey playing Dr. Doom. Right. I th I just think there's an issue for me. I'm I'm so aligned with him as Iron Man, Tony Stark in the MCU. Sure that I don't know that I'm going to be able to see past the fact that he was Tony Stark and Iron Man. Yeah. Um, and I think, and, and I've said this before on the show, one of my biggest problems with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and there's a great line in the new Deadpool movie where they discuss how the multiverse thing hasn't been a great <laughs> thing for the Marvel Cinematic <laughs> Universe. Yeah. What, what does he say? He goes, losses. Yeah, yeah, let's it, just get it, over yeah. this. Yeah, let's and then, stop, uh, stop taking the L's. <laughs> this isn't and working. Then, 
And then Nice Pool says, yeah, but it's been steadily great since Endgame. <laughs> so, um, but I, I think I, th- I think to the point of even when you're watching Deadpool and Wolverine and Matthew's characters, uh, Paradox is talking about the anchor being and he died in such a incredibly uh, 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 superhero heroic way. We all our minds automatically go to Tony Stark and Iron sure. Man. And obviously, they switch it to to Wolverine. But I don't know. I think. So I, I guess to your point about box office, I don't know that Downey as Doctor Doom is the answer to bringing more box office in for Marvel again. I don't sure. think that. I mean, it, listen, there could be a slight uptick from that for sure. Um, I just don't know if it's the it's it's the definitive thing. I think you're what you're saying about Deadpool Wolverine. It was a cinematic event. Um, you know, it's a film that works. You know really on its own in a way well, um and and so I, I i think i don't know i i find it fascinating I, I don't know i think one of the things we discussed early on in the, in the year was whether or not this movie would save marvel hence the marvel jesus thing we were talking about earlier sure and i th- i do think that there is lessons to be learned from this um that the idea of you know having these characters come together in a singular story of some sort um but to me it just it just really works because like you said bringing hugh jackman back having him as Wolverine, all the drama that led into this, the feud over the years with Ryan and Hugh jokingly. Um, I just don't think you can recreate this again. Well, um, you know, but I, I'm going to parrot Kevin Feige just for a minute. Um, they have to be good movies. Yeah. If, yeah. If Deadpool and Wolverine came out and was the quality level of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Right. It wouldn't have legs. Right. I, I think Gabe's 100 percent right in that putting Downey back into the MCU is going to have a curiosity factor and people will turn up to see what it is. But But do you see what I mean about how we saw him die? Oh yeah. But but Marvel knows that, right? Like that's the question that I'm saying, like that, what you're, that question you're asking is going to sell your ticket. Like he's going to cause you to buy your ticket. Cause you're going to go, how am I going to not? Well, no, it's just, it's just, you're going to go, but it's Downey and it's Iron Man. I have all Mm. these connections to it how like you're just gonna mm. wonder how they make that work and between sure. now and then i don't know how much we'll learn but but is and that question it, enough to get people back in the theater in the for in the, that in the, first in, one yes in the long in run, the way know. that they came back in the original like like in that first 10 years of marvel well, do you think we'll ever get back to that it's almost like if you had taken hugh jackman for this movie and cast him in something else People yeah. came back to this to see Hugh as Wolverine, mm-hmm. you know, Correct. now you're asking Downey to come back and play a different character. I, I again, I am fascinated to find out how I also think you're going to see him as Dr. Doom in the Fantastic Four movie beforehand. Mm. I think he'll I think he'll sort of show up in that one and it'll be a bit of a tease before we get to that. But I'm curious, thinking more about that. I wonder if we see Downey or if we see doom you know what i mean like we see like a glove mm. like a like a like a, a costume or something okay like if they just the sort mask of, yeah like they just without you know we now know they put Downey's face on it so you know it's him but they don't use his face in the movie yeah yeah, yeah. but I also but also the, the only other thing about tony stark though is tony stark has a lot of similar mannerisms and conversation styles as robert Downey jr does sure. so i think Doom would have to be a very different character. I have said this to Gabe. It needs to be a 180 degree turnaround yeah, performance. No humor. Like no I humor. I can't see Downey no. doing his Downey shtick because that no. is so Tony Stark. Yeah. Yeah. It's too cheap, Sean, for it to be like Doom in a different universe is Tony Stark gone bad. I think that that's wrong. Yeah, I think that I think that'd be the it's wrong way to easy, do it. It's too easy, right? Yes. So, yeah. So, Kev, so one of the explanations is just in the in a different universe, Tony Stark didn't become Iron Man. Tony Stark became Dr. Doom instead. Now, that is interesting. Is it? Because then you're just getting Tony Stark. Yeah. No, but 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 again, like all the different Deadpools in in the movie, they're all different. So, like, had this been the worst Tony Stark, like the worst Wolverine. Sure. And he's I I actually think that's a cool idea. I, I think the problem I'm having is is I'm having a hard time with Robert Downey Jr. playing a completely different character. If sure. he's Tony Stark in a different world that went bad, that broke bad, I could get behind that. See, that's interesting that's to cool. hear you say that because that's cool. The bigger problem is that 
Victor Von Doom, the comic character, has a deep backstory, like a rich history with with Rich, Reed Richards and the Fantastic Four. Mm. And I'm afraid they're going to wipe that clean. I'm afraid they're not going to get into exploring that. So there's like the comics lover side. And then there's people who want to see what they're going to do with Downey. And again, this is the curiosity factor. It's like, how is mm. Marvel going to approach it? Kev, how do you feel about the Russos coming back? I mean, obviously, they they are they they have proven that they are you know, there are the filmmakers in the MCU that have delivered the best moments. I mean, sure. Winter Soldier, Infinity War, Civil War and Endgame. Did you? Uh, you can't. You can't. I know. T- yeah. You can't match that. I but mean, like so, those are. But do four. they do they mess with that, though? Do you mess with your track record? Uh, it's I a mean, risk. Listen, did I, you I, see? I, I, well, the yeah. did you see the reported payday that that was refuted by like some anonymous oh, no, source what was at it? Marvel? Was it? According to Variety, again, in their own article, they say that someone close to the production said that it was lower than this, but that they were coming back for the two movies for $80 million. I mean, listen, <laughs> which is cra- that, plus crazy. plus ba- like it doesn't have back end, but there are additional things that kick in uh, at 750 and a billion dollar box office mark. L- let me ask a question. Do you think Sean Levy got close to taking it or no? Taking, taking Avengers? Yeah. Do you think he? Do you think he came close after? Like, do you think they offered it to him? I don't think he would. No. I, I, I feel like he wouldn't even. I feel like really? I, I feel like he he's gonna want to just do his own his own thing. Yeah. Is, is he doing a Star Wars movie? I think so. I think he does have a Star Wars movie yeah. in play, but who does a Star Wars thing. movie? Well, he has play. Stranger Things that he's got to finish. Sure, 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 sure. Deadpool felt more like him and Ryan doing a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Yeah, Deadpool probably feels more like a free guy than than a, than, a, than a Marvel film in a, in a way. It is interesting that so D- Destin Daniel Cretton was attached to one of the Avengers films, but well, the Avengers five when it was Kang Dynasty and then Ryan Coogler was attached to Secret Wars, you know, early on. And now they're both off and the Russos get those. So it makes me wonder what those two maybe Destin goes back to Shang-Chi, too. If they eventually develop that and then Ryan, I'm not maybe Ryan goes on to do something different. I, don't know I love Shang-Chi. Yeah, you're. I love a Coogler original. I would He's kind of been in the IP thing. Yeah. Between Creed and Marvel. Do you think Mahershala ends up playing Blade? So we were talking about that moment. um, (laughs) It's such a good moment. When he says there's only been one Blade, when Wesley Snipes says there's only ever been one Blade, and they deliberately one Blade. They deliberately cut to Deadpool as he looks at the camera. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 that to me was Mahersha Ali getting his agent on the phone and being like, what is going on here? Dude, look at Wesley Snipes' Instagram. He posted, uh, I mean, I'm assuming he posted this as a joke. I'm just going to, it's literally an article about, about Wesley coming back as Blade and not Mahershala. It says, <laughs> it says, let me find it. I, I mean, he might have taken it down. I saw it yesterday. Here it is. This is on Wesley Snipes' Instagram. It says, yeah. cancel Mahershala Ali's Blade movie and bring Wesley Snipes' Daywalker into the MCU. And then under it, Wesley does y'all crazy, ha ha ha. So he's clearly making a joke about it. But, I mean, it's on his page. You go to, go to, go to Wesley's page. It literally says that on his page. So, <laughs> so what, I don't how, know what, how serious that is. How old is Wesley? Wesley Snipes is 62 years old. But he's so good in Deadpool Wolverine. Hey, hey, hey <laughs> Han Solo. Han Solo is a Hulk now, so I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Yeah. Point dude, taken. Dude, uh, point when, taken. I'm, I'm telling you, the ice skate uphill line. That well, was, here's the thing. Might have been the happiest I've been in a movie theater in years. When he said here's that line, thing. I was like, oh my gosh. At of those characters, I don't. I think Gambit worked fine in that small amount <laughs> for a funny right? bit. Yeah, yeah. I don't need to see a Channing Tatum Gambit movie. <laughs> no, that's the point, though. I think that that was the whole thing. It was like that. That is one of the funniest bits. And if you when you see the movie a second time, which I know you have, they wait a good five, ten minutes before they make the dialect joke. Like you're you're kind of going, oh, yeah, why yeah. is his accent so bad? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then they they and then the way that and then the way Deadpool just continues to tell so us he, what he actually means. <laughs> here's the thing. As I was going, as I was watching it the second time though, I was thinking a lot of on rewatch. And when you're at home, that sequence in particular, right? <laughs> is gonna feel like an eternity because there are applause breaks built into that. 
Yes. It's like each person walks out and you got to like the movie gives the audience a beat yeah. to react to each well, of those different people. Because it's so meta because Deadpool, like, he knows we're, what we're watching the movie. That might be one of the funniest. I think one of the funniest lines to me, the funniest line is when he keeps telling Jackman he's going to have to play Wolverine until he's 90. <laughs> till you're that's, 90. That's the greatest. But when um, <laughs> he's getting everybody hyped up to go into Cassandra Nova's headquarters and then Jackman's like, you're all going to die. And he's like, Jesus, read the room. <laughs> read the room. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, the movie is so funny. But I was going to say, of all those characters, the only one that I legitimately would like to see more of is Wesley Snipes' as Blade. And, and the way that yeah. they said... What if you gave him a Logan type send off movie that that's probably the way to go with that franchise instead of trying to relaunch it? I don't dude, I don't know why they've been having such a hard time with that. And maybe the maybe the answer is. They were trying to go in a different direction and do Mahershala. It never really got off the ground. They couldn't figure out the script or the or the director. And now they're trying to figure out, can they do something moving forward? With did they Wesley ever Pe confirm that they wanted to make it R rated or not? Did they ever I, confirm? Like I a, think they did. Yeah. OK, I'm pretty sure I was that curious was if, it, if it started to get a hang up around all of that. Like once you get into Marvel making at the time, I guess, like their first R rated MCU movie. Yeah, I was curious if it just the 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 line between what was too far. And then now you have Deadpool with all of this. Like, I wonder if it's just that goalpost of what they want to achieve with sure. that just keeps moving. And you're right in that not every Marvel project needs to be R and, and most of them shouldn't be R to be honest with yeah, you. You know, right. like yeah. maybe Daredevil, but right, I don't, you don't need Spider-Man Spider adding the movie. F. Yeah, yeah, I don't need Spider-Man <laughs> adding the F word into his quips as he yeah, said. It would, it would be kind of cool to see Spider-Man shoot the web and like take someone's head off with it. That, that would be pretty amazing. <laughs> that would be kind of cool. Like, like think about think about the I think someone did this on Line. Well, you want to watch this. I think what you're saying, Kevin, is you want to watch Craven the Hunter. Well, no, I know. <laughs> there, there's a YouTube channel where they they make R-rated versions of the Marvel films, and, and it's a, like like Captain America throwing his shield and it, it decapitating somebody. That's why sure, I was saying. Right. That, I mean, if you were if you were to do an R-rated Spider-Man, he could literally shoot the web out of his hand. Sure. And then yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring, a, bring a bring a head back. That'd I think be kind of sick. You should watch the boys. <laughs> you should yeah, watch yeah, the man, boys. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This I mean, is essentially I, what happens. Oh, Sean, where are you at on the boys? Sorry, just quick tangent. Still beginning of season three. Okay, I, okay. I'm on episode three or four, I think. Season, see, like I said, season season four has. Oh. You get introduced to their 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 version of Spider Man, and I My can't wait next, to get your thoughts. My next episode is uh, is it Hero Gasm? Is that what it's called? Oh, oh yes. That's what it's text, called. That's... text me after that. Okay. What season is that again? <laughs> season three. Take a yeah. shower and then text me after. That. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, a pretty yeah. wicked one. Yeah. I happened to look at the title episode. I was like, oh, I've heard of that at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know. I know something's coming. <laughs> um, all right, Kev. Last thoughts on Deadpool and Wolverine. Yeah, I mean, I've seen it twice. You know, since. I haven't seen a, pl a film play like a rock concert like that in a long time. And, and, and the second time around, there's so many jokes that I didn't hear the Minions joke the first time around. It, I, there's so many jokes that I missed um, yeah. on the first viewing, which is a really good problem to have, obviously, when your sure. crowd is laughing that hard and you're missing stuff. Um, I for, there's a scene in Deadpool Wolverine. So if, if you watch my interviews, like I, I try to. Not, not not turn my interviews into like therapy sessions, but I like to talk a lot about thematics and deeper meanings behind even films like Deadpool Wolverine, which is, you know, meant to be a fun over, you know, a, a you know, joyous experience. But I feel like at the end of the day, Deadpool Wolverine is, as Sean Levy put it, it's a, it's a love letter to the Wolverine. It's a mm. really it's a film about trauma. If you actually take a step back and look at what that film is dealing with, it's about trauma, overcoming that finding friends and family, um, you know, just not being able to live with guilt, uh, you know, and I think the Wolverine character, that's what I love about this film. And Hugh Jackman said this in an interview as well. Like they got to do things with the character where they got to kind of, they got to kind of heal him, mm. you know, emotionally. Mm. Um, and I loved that. I, I think some of the most powerful moments in this film are don't aren't, comedic or, or you know or violent there's a scene in the road trip portion of this of the of the movie which is like kind of planes trains and automobiles idea because we know ryan loves john candy and i think he like planes trains is like one of his favorite movies of all time i think he put it on his top four for letterboxd mm. um 
Do you remember the scene when they're in the car and Jackman just rips into him? Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. We were talking about that. that. Uh, uh, they gave him a real, like, Hugh Jackman emotional Whoa. moment. And a side of Wolverine that we haven't gotten before, that we got a little yeah. bit in Logan, but that was, like, a, even a different kind of anger. Very but cool. the way Ryan's Deadpool... So, I remember on the first Deadpool film, I don't know how they do it nowadays, but the mask... Ryan's Deadpool mask is really fascinating. His eyes are subtly animated. Right. Um, and so if you actually watch Deadpool emote in the film when he's dealing with his emotions, like he almost looks like a puppy dog. Like there are like moments where his eyes really kind of tell the whole story. Didn't and Ryan Sean say Levy, that they capture his facial reactions? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So when on the first Deadpool movie, I asked him this and I'm not sure if they're still doing it this way now. Um, but Ryan shoots everything in the mask. Then he takes the mask off, takes his iPhone shoots the scene again, but gives the Weta, or I don't know if it's Weta now, it was Weta, gives Weta the facial expressions of what he's saying, and then they map those expressions onto the mask subtly. It's wild. So, like, his eyes, so there's a couple moments in Deadpool Wolverine where you really see, like, an emotional, genuine, like, sadness coming through the mask, because he mm. can't really emote any other way. But in that scene, like, I just, everyone who goes back to see it again, look at his face in that scene. Like the way he takes that dialogue and that monologue, no one's ever spoken to him like that before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and to me, it's like it's I think these characters are broken. Both of them. They both have severe trauma. They both lost incredible um, loved ones in their lives. And they're both just trying to get some relief. There's a moment in Deadpool Wolverine where Cassandra has Wolverine sitting out in a field and she quiets all the voices mm. in his head for a, that is to me one of the most beautiful moments in the film even though what really happens in that scene is they're trying to capture her that scene kind of reminds me of that scene in Infinity War when they have Thanos by the neck mm. and Chris Pratt makes you know uh, you know messes it up and then they, and then he, and he get, and he gets out and mm -hmm. the same thing happening here with Cassandra and they're putting the helmet around her mm. um but those to me, those moments to me are the ones that hit the hardest, even at the end, like in the beginning, when when Deadpool Wade is sitting across from Favreau and he's like, I just mm. want to matter to my girl. Um, to me, that's what makes these films work. Mm. Like, I think a lot of a lot of is a lot of discussion is put on the language and the violence. And I think at the end of the day, these movies have an incredible heart to them. Dude, I remember crying at the end of Deadpool 2. I think in the theatrical version, Take On Me is playing when he puts his hand into the afterlife and he becomes Ryan again outside of the Remember the So at the end of Deadpool 2, he dies for a moment. Yeah. And he's all scarred in real life. And then he, when he enters in to, to meet, is it Vanessa? Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He literally goes through like this water field and like mm -hmm. his body goes back to normal Ryan. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and she's like, oh, it's not your time. And she pushes him back and he comes mm -hmm. back to life. Um, all that stuff just hits so hard to me. Um, I love that's why I love the Deadpool films. Like I sit there and I, I get an emotional experience. The way they treated Wolverine in this film, it just felt like it was 24 years in the making of giving this guy the right <coughs> arc. Because I, yeah. I, I, I think we sometimes forget how tragic these characters are. Sure. Yeah, they're but really tragic. I we were arguing last week that the one if the movie misses on anything, I wish it showed us a little bit more about what Wolverine did wrong, like to make oh, him like, the worst Wolverine. Well, you know, I think, we get told the story. I would like to have mm, seen a little bit more of that, especially in an R-rated movie when you can. But what, yeah, see yeah. what what I what I kind of like about that. What I liked about not seeing it was the reason why it was too I was confusing, though, is the issue for me. It wasn't just like the show don't tell thing. It was so many people I talked to had a different version of what he did and in not in like a good way, not in like an interesting way and like, a, mm. oh, but like, so this happened. I was like, well, no, he also took it this far. And people were like, oh, that is OK. So that like there was everyone I talked to kind of had a it was mm. just a point of confusion that was like, I really would have taken five minutes of your runtime. Mm -hmm. to like the scene where like he's on all the bodies like one of those scenes where like they go through yes. different wolverines maybe take the budget of one of those and give us that guy's story you know what i mean like yeah. that could have sold it for me so this wolverine that we're dealing with but my but it, my perspective on his story is that he went out drinking and the hum like as he said the humans came in and killed all the x-men and killed he came back hammered drunk and saw all their dead bodies and yes. then he wears now the yellow suit 
because it reminds him of so that's of that's what of I that. got. That's the confusion. It's not just that. From what I okay. understand, so so he goes out, he leaves them. He mentions some other thing about like him leaving and not being there is like another right. thing of like him, you know, not wanting to be around anybody. The the school of the actual X Men, they get killed while he's not there. So when he comes back in a fit of rage, he kills a bunch of humans. Like right. he kills a ton of humans, so much right. so that then humanity finally, because the whole X Men story is is right. is is the, is the sort of genocide of mutants sort of thing mm-hmm. that that fight that they're dealing with. Then they go, okay, well we're just gonna kill all the mutants, and they finally do it. But because he's immortal, he's the only surviving one, mm-hmm. and so he's left knowing that. Because he wasn't there, his friends died. And then because of what he did, everyone like him is dead. And so right. that's why he's the worst Wolverine. But yeah. again, this is my point. That's a great thing to show and would make all the emotion work even more. But it just is kind mm. of confusing. I, I think that's that. a great story moment. We just don't really get it. I do want yeah. to single out that point where she turns off the voices, though. In, in both oh. of those moments, that silence Mm. personally mm. hits because yeah. G- Gabe and I are having this conversation in Comic-Con like my brain is is moving all the time yes and and I have music playing in my head all the time all the time yeah. all the fucking time what would it feel like to be completely silent each each moment that I experienced that moment in the movie it reminds like I didn't even I wasn't even aware of how much noise was happening in the film itself right yes and then you I heard that silence and it's like it was instantly pacifying, you know, and I yeah. was like, Jesus Christ, could someone just do that? Can someone right. please just do that? You'd I give would one of those helmets. That. I'd oh, give them. Yeah. <laughs> should, 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 should I rock that helmet? Juggernaut helmet. <laughs> yeah. Could you imagine? Well, like I am with you. It's like that, that uh, from a mental health perspective, that scene yeah. hits very differently. Could you imagine like what that would feel like to have just your voices silent? Two two other points I want to make. One, I, it is hands down one of the best openings to a film I've ever seen. Oh like god, the, edi- the editing beats of that end sync track. What? Well, were I had that song in my head for ever since. <laughs> I think Astounding. I had it yesterday. Still, yeah. In my head. <laughs> when we were sitting there watching that, I was blown away. Um, and then I also want to say how absolutely terrifying it is to watch. Nova's fingers going through people's heads. Oh, oh my god. god. It yes. actually hurts That's, my brain. It's you get, so brutal. You get an R rating for that alone. Yes, that was like, just so when, when Matthew's when she's uh, when, killing Matthew McFadden at the end. Oh when she's, god. There's a yeah. moment where she starts to walk down the steps yes. of the subway dragging. and she's dragging his body. Oh. It hurt. It actually hurts my head. Dude, they're like remember the moment when the moment when she first goes into Paradox's head? And his eyeball pops as her oh. fingers are going through. <laughs> and I, I love which character is the one that tries to shoot Nova. And then he says, don't put your fingers in my head. I'll, I'll just tell you oh, what, that's what's going a on. Pyro. Oh, that's Pyro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love pyro. when he's like, what if you just just ask? Yeah, just ask. <laughs> I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you. Oh, we I didn't that, talk about the uh, uh, the Chris Evans moment, too, which uh, was <laughs> and the one of the the, the, the credit scene. Well, the, I mean, I, just his, his reveal his is death. terrific. And oh, then his, it's so good. Yeah. His scene at the end is also fantastic. When she rips his skin off. And I love the way that they explain that later <laughs> on. He's like, he turned him into like, a, what does he say? He's like. He's like, he ripped his skin off and his, I don't remember what he said about it, yeah. but the way Deadpool described it was exactly what it felt like to watch. Wait, let me ask you this. Do you think the scene in the end credits really happened? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you yeah. think Johnny Storm did say all yeah, that yeah, stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yes. he's so convincing. Like, I don't even know what half those words mean. I, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so, it's yes. so good. Well, and he it's, absolutely did it. There's also the meta of we get to see Chris Evans say r-rated Curse. stuff yeah, in the MCU. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like yeah, we yeah. can see steve rogers <laughs> say these things well that's yeah. why it's brilliant before we ever know it's johnny yeah when he says he says his first curse word right he says something and deadpool goes like what and then all of a sudden <laughs> goes, i'm ready avengers flame on <laughs> like that is like that is such a smart that's so good. That movie is amazing, man. It really is incredible when you actually sit down and think about it like all the stuff i was saying about the emotions that stuff is what I resonate with. Sure. But there are so many big moments. But like, yeah, I just I don't know. For for me, it's like the little things at the end when Wolverine's walk or this is another thing I want to bring up. And I mentioned this in my interview. There's a 
that to me, this is the first time I had a real distinction of who Logan is versus Wolverine and who Wade is versus Deadpool. Like, I think over the time with superheroes, we, we look at them as a as a one entity, Tony Stark and Iron Man, Peter Parker and, and Spider-Man. I think what I loved about this was the distinction between who Logan is and who Wolverine is, mm. who Wade is and who Deadpool is. And that moment at the end when when Logan's walking away and 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 Wade stands up and then he brings him home. Mm. Um, I just love that moment. And then the last shot with the two masks. And also, can we just talk about how sick that one is during that fight? The it's really cool. I didn't, I didn't like when they sped it up. That that bothered well, me just a tiny well, bit. I think when they go into the bus. Yeah. Um, I think it gets oh. sped up did by you, like a half speed kind of did thing. Did you see the Stan Lee cameo in that? What? No. Oh, it's not. I mean, it's not cameo. But uh, so the as the shot is tracking along the bus. Yeah. The camera goes up and then down on the yeah. bus side. It's a Stan. It's Stan Lee's image. And it says something about like Stan Lee or something. I can't remember. What Are the you exact kidding word. me? Oh, yeah, I've yeah, always yeah. watched. It's the cowboy Wolverine who goes out I, the top of the bus. I think that right, right below that shot. There's okay. a Stan Lee like um, an ad. On the bus side. Oh, that's cool. What does it All say? Right. It's, no, it's, I totally it's, missed it. Then it's like a, it's like a joking thing. It's like a, it's like it's like he's a character of himself, but it says Stan Lee or something. I can't remember what it okay. says now. That's cool. Um, but but that shot. I mean, for people who haven't seen Old Boy, that's what that reminded me. Of. I don't I don't know sure. if Sean was going for that, but it reminded me of the tracking shot of Old Boy. But dude, when they're fighting alongside, that all, <laughs> I also got to point out how funny Nice Pool is. That yeah. is. That is a great character. Like, like when he uses him as a human shield, and he's just like <laughs> smiling the whole time. In his, his <laughs> but I wonder why he couldn't regenerate. I'm curious about that. It's a good I, question. Uh, yeah, yeah. I wonder I why know. he couldn't regenerate. Because I love when could. I love when Jackman says, "I get to kill a hundred of yous." <laughs> where, do I, where do I sign up? Or, you, uh, or something like that. Also, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, another moment that I, I, I genuinely get teary eyed in is when they're holding hands at the end with the antimatter and matter. Yeah. Look at his abs. That. Makes you cry. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Of course, with the abs. When Deadpool's like, like that. You know, no, but, no, it's, dude, it's the way they use the Madonna song in that. Yeah, song. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. amazing. It's a, it's cool. And yeah, then yeah. don't they flash back to like moments yes. of, I mean, yeah. it's so yeah. incredible. Yeah. Oh, but that's the thing. It's a movie that couldn't exist without 20 years of history. You know, like it needs the, that yeah. kind of build up. That's a bit why No Way Home works as well as it does. If yeah. you don't have that history, you know, you need to have. Oh, there's so much emotion that comes with the I, the montage of the Fox stuff. With that's it. Green Day is phenomenal, but it's because we care so much. Did you see the Green Day video that they posted today? Trey Cool no. dressed up. Oh, uh -uh. look, go to Green Day's Instagram when you get off here. OK, I think they I think they there's a whole they do a whole thing with it. It's funny. Oh, that's cool. All right. Very cool. I'll Sean, look before it. we wrap. Yes. Do we get a Deadpool four? I don't think so. I don't think you'll get a traditional Deadpool sequel. But what I think is those characters are now parked in that universe for when Marvel needs them later for one of the big Avengers movies. I like, think Deadpool might come back, but I think in Secret Wars. I mean, probably. but when this when this makes a billion and something, I know. Again, again, not that they would do it just to do it, but they would. <laughs> but they would. No, I understand. They would, they would. I understand. I mean, I mean, I think in Secret Wars, like Secret Wars is going to be everybody. And yeah. so you've got X-23 and Jackman's Wolverine and Deadpool are in that universe happily now. And I think they'll just get pulled into whatever the big battle is. So you'll see them again in that way. Now, is there another Deadpool after that? Maybe. Maybe. You know, maybe it's post. It's just post one of those Wars. things that feels weird that it's you would think by the second weekend crushing this much, they'd be like, and Deadpool 4 is greenlit. Like, you know, know. you get that story. Just well, we don't even we don't have a Spider-Man 4 yet. Yeah. Yeah. True. So D23 is coming up on the 7th, I think, or the 9th. Um, oh, this it's this, this weekend. Week, this weekend yeah, yeah, it'll be this weekend. And Marvel should be part of the big presentation Friday night. So maybe while you're yeah. listening to this. There we go. That's we actually will, a good time for it. No more information about what's coming Deadpool up. And I almost Wolverine feel like, too. I almost feel like no. You don't think no? I mean, I, mean, I, the, I can see them leaving it alone. Yeah. Totally. There is a line, though, at the end when when they say um, 
What's what's the character who says to both of them? You, you, I have a feeling this is just the beginning, or what? What, what does oh, she say? She's B fifteen. She's one of the from, TVA from, agents. From yeah, Loki. from Loki. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She but says, she says something. Feeling, this is the this is the be- just the beginning for you two, or something like that. Right. And I don't I don't get the sense like now that I think Till about you're it, you're ninety. Ryan Ryan Reynolds <laughs> would probably want to give like a not a Logan esque, but would want to give like a send off if he was done playing Deadpool, you know, or probably. like mm. so it doesn't really feel like that. You know, what's interesting is that, like, I don't think Deadpool has a ton of side characters that you want to see him with. Like, Cable is a huge one, which they did. Yeah. Um, and, and Wolverine would be a huge one as well, too. But I could see him being used in, like, you could put him in a Spider-Man movie. You know, <laughs> like, I don't know if he gets a, a traditional Deadpool 4, but, like, they use, maybe they use him a lot. I don't know. Maybe also, when the X-Men movie happens, he's part of that. I don't know. I feel like we're sleeping on the Deadpool Wolverine first fight in this movie when Wolverine's on oh, all great. fours he's on that's all so fours yeah he says that, it he says let's give them what they want or what they can't oh, yeah yeah he's like he's like uh, it's gonna get good get your special sock <laughs> it's out gonna nerds. get good <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. dude that fight is absurd also I mean I posted something about this today can we start talking about one of the best shots of the year is when is when Wolverine or Deadpool is laying on the ground and Wolverine walks up in that shadow it was in the teaser trailer. Yeah. And like he puts the puts the you know, puts the claws out. That shot is so they did that uh, 20 minutes before the sun went down. That's, that's all cool. practical. The only thing that's not practical are the, are the claws coming out of his hands. They that, that is actually Hugh. That is actually Ryan. They marked it. They got the exact lineup and they did it in like a 20 minute window. The end Here's of the, the shoot. thing. Sick. I've come I've come from as a comic book fan now the first time Wolverine pops his claws in X-Men when he is in the bar fight yeah I, I lost my shit because they got the sound right oh, you know yeah. like just the sound was right of them coming out and now I I have a, a Wolverine Deadpool movie where like there's a slow motion shot of the claws coming out to the sick to the script and I'm like <laughs> It's an embarrassment of riches. Like, how could you even exist? And you got your, uh, your comic accurate uh, tiny hue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is there and anything? Cavill. Oh, oh Cavill. my God. Oh. Cavill's great. Yeah. And then the DC joke. Is there anything like crazy or cooler than that moment when when Deadpool gets to the title card? And he gets to do, do, do the, do oh the claws on his own. Oh and then God. just they, they pause it and then they go around to his butt. Like it's like it's that whole ins- that whole scene is just, oh, my God. It's when so I tell you, good. When it's I tell so you good. during the opening sequence to the, uh, the NSYNC song that the whole oh. whole H was da- like everybody was dancing in their seat. Like it was just an infectious vibe. I think it's incredible. It's like top 10 of the year. I was going to say, is it all where, how is it in your top five? Yes. Oh, 100% top five of the year for yeah. me. Sean? Right. I don't know. A lot of movies to come. Long year. I, I went four I mean, right out now. of five. I went four out of five on it, ultimately. I went four out it's of five. It's better than that. I don't know. I, four out of five is good. It's strong. I Sean thought it was really strong. Sean hasn't seen Borderlands yet, so. It's true. true. Good point. Yeah. Trap is higher than it. I just wanted to, <laughs> I to see Kevin's reaction to that. Uh, given the options that are out there. So we have it ends with us and Borderlands opening this week. And then, of course, all the other stuff you guys still have to catch up on. Uh, let me know in the comments down below uh, what you are going to see this weekend. What's bringing you out to theaters? This is Deadpool Wolverine again. Uh, if you're seeing that again, let me see your review and your star ratings. And um, we'll be back with a little bit more content for you guys in the coming weeks, we've got a few bonus episodes coming up. We've got uh, some fun interviews in the hopper. Tiff is around the corner. Maybe we'll all be up there for that. Who's to say? Uh, so in the meantime, follow us on social media at Jake's Takes, at Kevin McCarthy TV, at Sean underscore O'Connell, at Gabe Kovach. And the show is at Real Blend. Until then, we'll see you guys soon. Take care. Jaws. <laughs> Dunkirk. <laughs>